Welcome everyone to The Real News Network. My name is Maximilian Alvarez. I'm the editor-in-chief here at The Real News. And it's great to have you all with us. Here at The Real News, we've been working hard to bring y'all on the ground coverage of the many vital worker struggles that have been taking place around the country. From strikes or potential strikes at Columbia University and healthcare giant Kaiser Permanente, to rank and file movements for more democratic union representation within the United Auto Workers and the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. In text articles, podcasts, and YouTube interviews, we've been bringing y'all voices and perspectives from workers and organizers on the front lines of these crucial battles, which we should all be invested in. But, you know, as we know, the American media landscape has a long way to go to make up for the decades of, frankly, bad or just plain absent coverage on the labor movement. And there are a lot of important details regarding workers' struggles and the barriers that workers face to successfully fighting back against the bosses that go unreported or underreported today. And one of those details concerns the ways that companies like Warrior Met Coal and Kellogg's, two companies where workers have been on strike for months, are effectively weaponizing the court system to try to break strikes and to roll back workers' rights, including their essential right to picket when they're on strike. In a recent article for the New York Times, Sarah Nelson, uh, president of the Association of Flight Attendants, wrote this, quote, for too long, the courts have sided with corporations over labor, fundamentally and perniciously reshaping American law, life, and liberty. Today, they are doing their part to unravel the American dream and the social contract that has been in place since the 1940s, offering the working class a good life if they spend 40 hours on the job, the means to enjoy it in off hours and a secure retirement. In one stark example, a judge in Alabama in October barred union mine workers from picketing within 300 yards of mine entrances, even as the authorities there have failed to charge the drivers of vehicles that struck lawful picketers. In a more common infringement of free speech, a judge in Iowa limited United Auto Workers picket lines outside a John Deere plant in Davenport last month to just four people at each entrance to the plant. The wholesale theft of workers' rights is happening in broad daylight. With the help of conservative judges, corporations have systematically weakened labor laws for decades, leaving workers fewer and fewer tools to hold their bosses accountable. In the rare cases when workers win judgments against a bad boss, employers rarely face more than a slap on the wrist, end quote. So as I mentioned before, and as Sarah Nelson referenced in this piece for the New York Times, striking workers at Warrior Met Coal, but also workers who were on strike at farming equipment giant John Deere, and workers who have been at strike at Kellogg's, have faced these kinds of repressive measures that have been enacted through the courts at the behest of the companies themselves where the workers are striking. It's really important that all of us who are invested in the labor movement and all of us who are workers ourselves understand how the law can be and is being used against workers in this country. And it's equally important for us to learn from different workers' struggles how this all plays out on the ground and how we can fight against it. And that is precisely what we're going to do here today. And I'm honored to be joined by two guests who are here to help us navigate this thorny issue, which they have both been confronting firsthand. So joining me today is uh, first Larry Spencer, uh, who is currently serving as vice president for District 20 of the United Mine Workers of America. And Larry has been fighting with and for the 1,100 coal miners who have been on strike at Warrior Met Coal in Alabama since April, which we've been covering extensively here at The Real News. I'm also honored to be joined by Dan Osborne. Uh, who, as y'all know, um, based on a previous interview that I had with Dan, Dan has worked at the Kellogg's plant in Omaha, Nebraska for 18 years and currently serves as president of the Bakery, Confectionery, Tobacco Workers and Grain Millers International Union or the BCTGM Local 50G down there in Omaha. 
1,400 Kellogg's workers at plants in Nebraska, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Tennessee went on strike beginning on October 5th, and as of right now, are still on strike, as are the workers at Warrior Met Coal. So, Dan, Larry, thank you both so much for joining me. I know you got a lot going on, and it's a real honor to have you both here at The Real News. Thank you, Max. So I was wondering, you know, I, I want us to dig into this question of, you know, the specific question of how y'all have been fighting on multiple fronts, including in the courtroom, you know, with these, uh, you know, judges essentially working to restrict, you know, mine workers and Kellogg's workers' abilities to pick it. But I was wondering if we can actually start um, since I have both of you here, if we could start um, by giving Real News viewers and listeners an update on the strikes at Warrior Met Coal and the strike uh, at Kellogg's. Um, so, Larry, do you think you could uh, maybe give us an update on where things stand now and, and uh, how folks are doing down there in Alabama? Yeah, well, uh, we started on April the 1st. Um, Today's 251 days of being on strike. Uh, and we've been negotiating with a company and with, with no success of uh, trying to get back what was lost in the bankruptcy back in 2016. See, this company that we're working for, Warrior Met Coal, they actually bought uh, these mines back in after. Jim Walters went bankrupt. Uh, and there was a contract that was signed to try to keep them, get them up and going. And uh, and we did. The, the coal miners worked hard and, and got this company up and making a very good profit. And uh, so when it came time for this contract, uh, we asked for what we had given up back. And that's what had been promised to us through them anyway, was that, you know, once they got to be, to make them profit, that they would, uh, they would, you know, put it back into the workers' pockets. And, uh, and instead, they're putting it in their own. Their, their CEO makes $7 million a year. And they don't feel like it's they can afford to um, help or to put back more of what we lost back in 2016. And our guys are just, you know, I mean, April 1st, they decided that, hey, look, we're tired of what's going on. We, uh, we've got some labor board charges and we, we uh, came out on an unfair labor practice strike and was in negotiations too. And uh, this company has fought us tooth and nail all the way through this, uh, all the way up to date. And the biggest thing here lately has been in the courts and they've limited us, as you said, to we, we can't be within 300 uh, yards of any direction of the entrances. And if you know, if, if you look at the layout of their uh, coal mines, that, that pretty much shuts our picket lines down, you know? So we have still been uh, struggling to uh, keep up some sort of appearance out on around the mine sites in the areas that we can, uh, mostly at our union halls and, on the sides of the roads there at our union halls and letting people know we're still here. We uh, participated in a Christmas parade the other day and the community was, I mean, they was very excited to see us in that parade. And, uh, you know, we, we didn't do it necessarily for, for this strike. We felt like we needed to get, be seen out there. And, uh, and that was opportunity and, but we've we've been hit hard with just absolutely not being able to put our people on the picket line, and uh, but they're staying strong. We have a rally once every week 
Uh, every Wednesday night, we have a rally. Uh, right now, it's at 5 o'clock. We're talking about moving the time, but uh, we, uh, we usually have quite a few people out there, anywhere from 200 to 500 people. Uh, and we try to give them an update once a week of where we're at. Hadn't been a lot of movement, so there hadn't been a lot to update besides that, you know, we're we're still here and we're fighting to uh, get them through Christmas and stuff. So but that's pretty much where we're at right now. And, and, you know, for, for folks watching and viewing, we'll obviously link to some of our coverage in the show notes for this episode, but definitely go back and look at the reports that, like, Kim Kelly has done for The Real News, um, Working People episodes that we've done on the miners' strike. Um, but as Larry said, these mine workers have been on strike since the beginning of April. Uh, they've been holding the line. The, the the motto is one day longer, one day stronger, and the the kind of community is behind them. The, the auxiliary is behind them. Um, but that's a long damn time to be on strike, and it's really important that you know, all of us don't kind of get swept up in the news cycle and forget about the, the struggles that are still very much ongoing. So Larry, thanks so much for giving us that update, man. And Dan, I was wondering if, um, if you could kind of give us an update from the Kellogg's uh, picket line. And uh, I know that we've had some recent developments there, um, you know, act actually as of this morning. Yeah, it was about a half hour ago. I have here the uh, tentative agreement uh, that we voted on on Sunday. And the results just got back to us about a half hour ago where uh, it was overly, overwhelmingly rejected by our, our members. So uh, that means, you know, we hold the line. Uh, you know, I think, I think the company's leveraging uh, the winter months and uh, Christmas against us right now. Uh, there's some uh, two-tier language in the contract as, uh, you know, I can't speak to why every member voted or each member that voted no voted no. Uh, but there's there's some uh, language in there that uh, keeps the two-tier language, two-tier system strong. Uh, you know, only 3% of our lower tier uh, get to move up into the upper tier each year. Uh, we believe that number is too low. Uh, your transitional time uh, does not count towards your pension. So when you do move up, that kind of your time basically starts over. Even if you've spent eight years at Kellogg's on the lower tier, that that, that wouldn't count towards your pension. We don't believe that's, that's good enough. So, you know, I think we, we just don't want to leave anybody behind on this contract. You know, there are there are some good things. We, we got our cost of living. Um, language added back into the contract that they were trying to take away. Uh, but, you know, ultimately this, this tentative agreement that we voted down doesn't, doesn't offer enough security for the future, uh, uh, the future of our workers. And just like I was uh, saying before about uh, our real news coverage on the Warrior Met coal strike, uh, we will also be linking in the show notes here to our coverage on the Kellogg strike, which, as I said, has been going on since early October, uh, including a past interview that I got to do with Dan. So if folks watching want to know more about um, that two-tier wage system, and why it is such an important sticking point for for Kellogg's workers who want to overturn it uh, and what that will mean in the lives of rank and file workers. Uh, Dan explained that beautifully in our in our last interview. So I'd point folks to that. I would also point them to the great uh, text reporting that uh, Mel Bure has been doing for The Real News. So again, we'll, we'll link all of that in the show notes here so that folks watching can have that additional context on each of these important strikes and the, the topics that Larry and Dan are, are bringing up. But as I mentioned at the time, Top, one particular aspect of these strikes that we wanted to focus on today, because it's been so underreported and because it's so opaque to most of us, 
is this question of how um, companies like Warrior Met and Kellogg's are using the courts to roll back workers' protected rights to picket and basically their their right to free speech, um, and and that's you know something that again all of us should be concerned about and and invested in right now. You know, I think both uh, Larry and Dan, you you mentioned in in one form or another, right, that these companies. You know, one of the best tools that they have is time, right? They just want to wait out workers who are on the line. They want workers and their families to feel the squeeze uh, uh, on, on their bank accounts, especially as the holidays approach, as the winter months approach, and it gets colder out there on the picket line. It's a lot easier for workers to get demoralized, and companies are hoping that, hoping that you know, supporters around the country will just forget about these these struggles right so that's we know that that's one of their you know most vital tools that they use to try to break morale and break these strikes but they're not going to just leave it up to that right they're going to try to use other tools available to them like the courts um to sort of hamstring uh these different strikes and i, I think a lot of us don't really know how that works or what that looks like so i was wondering if we could go back around the table, starting with Larry, if you could just sort of break down for, for layman, like, you know, what, how Warrior Met and how Kellogg's have been using the strikes, like, to, you know, hurt, have been using the courts to hurt these strikes. Like, what exactly is going on there? Well, uh, you know, they, they, filed uh, to have injunctions put in uh, with uh, the court down in Tuscaloosa under James Roberts, uh, the judge. Um, and the, the main thing that they're going after is, you know, they're, they're calling it picket line violence, but they produced a video that was so hacked up that you know, you, you all you seen was things that happened from the picketers um, part. You didn't see where the the strikers were were actually hitting our people with cars and causing the people to turn around and try to stop them from from hitting them. And part of that was. To hit hit their cars, you know. I mean, they they turned around and uh, you know they was some different things that went on. You know, some windows busted and stuff. But it all started from those people hitting people with cars. Uh, we've had wives hit with cars. We've had uh, you know people that was actually just standing to the side of the picket line. They they swerved over and hit them with a car and uh, one of the wives was standing beside uh, the picket line one day and they swerved at her and hit her for no reason. And uh, of course, you know, <laughs> I don't know any man out there that's going to sit there and watch their wife get hit by a car and not do something back, you know, uh, you know, but they don't show that, you know, they take, they cut all that out and then they show the, the person, you know, stepping up and hitting a car or something, you know, and uh, they, they don't ever show what really started it. And, uh, and that's what the courts, the courts are turning it back on us because they're only seeing part of it. And they're not looking at our clips that we've got and we show where they are hitting the people and stuff. Uh, and, and, you know, I think, and, and not to get away from our strike, but I think shortly after John Deere started, there was a man killed on the picket line from a car hitting. And we was, you know, we were scared to death that something like that may happen on our picket line. And we was, hope, you know, doing things to try to stop that. But, you know, you can't, you can't keep people you can't keep keep people calm down when the, the company is allowing their people to do that kind of stuff. Uh, we we get 
you know, our, our laws and stuff says the picketers can't carry guns onto the picket line, and we're not. But we're getting guns pointed at us uh, every time we're on a picket line. You know, we have somebody come through and point a gun at us. And uh, so, you know, we've tried to take pictures of it. And what the company did was they uh, they paid to have the strikers' windows tinted down so that we couldn't see inside their cars. But we can't take a picture of the gun that is pointed at us. You can see it, but when you take a picture, it flashes, and you don't you can't catch what's inside. Uh, and we've had couple of professional photographers out there trying to get a picture of the gun that's been pointed at us. You, you just can't do it. But the, but the courts are seeing things that's happening from our side and they're, they're going against what they're, they're making. They're making these TROs to appear that we're the ones that's causing all of it. And uh, we're just not. I mean, we there there's videos out there that we have people stationed at these picket lines, and they tell the picketers, you know, to walk across the, the road, give them a break, and let one car in. Walk again, let one car in, and that's what the labor laws tell you to do. I mean, you know, we we've got a right to protest but we've got to do it in a certain way. And we've tried to keep people out there that was doing that and we still uh, are having people bump on cars and the, the, the police are turning their heads at it, you know? Not to say all of them, but there's a lot of them are just saying, well, I didn't see that, you know? And then when you take it in your own hands to try to get it stopped, then, they turn that, that kind of stuff against us with these videos. And uh, right now, uh, like we said in the beginning, uh, the injunction that's on us right now, I mean, we, we can't come anywhere close to the uh, entrance of there without putting ourselves in jeopardy of being arrested. And, uh, you know, we've, the uh, leadership of this union has, tried to keep its membership, you know, doing things in a way to keep them from getting in trouble. And uh, our main goal is to get them back to work. So I hope I didn't ramble too much there. So. Oh, no, that was great, man. And, and just to like, I guess, kind of uh, boil that down for, for viewers, right? Just to make sure that I have it right. So, you know, what, what Larry's describing, right, is, is 1,100 coal miners there at Warrior Met Coal in Brookwood, Alabama, have been on strike since April 1st. There's been an ongoing protracted strike. It's gotten, you know, like heated at the picket line because you have workers and their families walking the picket line, demanding, you know, a, a, a fair contract. <laughs> And you have scab workers basically driving in and out of the the entrance, hitting picketers, including you know like one one uh, coal miner's wife, and I believe sending her to the hospital. And so like this this sort of violence that that mine workers are experiencing on the Warrior Met coal picket line, you know, is is. Uh, you know, obviously really terrifying and very dangerous. Larry, you mentioned that at, at John Deere, where they got slapped with a similar injunction, one worker was actually killed, um, you know, by a car. So the stakes are very high here. And yet the company is essentially taking very selected clips of miners kind of pushing back against these these aggressive scabs or, or anti-union folks in their car they're only showing the courts that and saying oh it's the miners were the ones responsible for the violence but they're not showing that you guys are getting hit on the picket line by cars and that they're the ones instigating the violence and then they're using that to basically say that you can't be within 300 yards of the entrance effectively kind of pushing you off the map do i have that right 
That, you're, you're correct. And, and some of the other things that's going on is uh, our governor, Kay Ivey, uh, she is allowing state troopers to escort these scabs in, in uh, buses to the, uh, to the work area. Now, uh, the, the thing about it is, is most of these scabs are from Kentucky, Illinois, uh, Virginia, and she's allowing them to escort them in with Alabama tax dollars to a work area that I've never been escorted into. You know, we've never been escorted one time. We have actually had people that's got tickets from the state troopers for running the speed limit. And they said, well, there was blue lights behind you. There wasn't a safe place to pull over. Did we know the scabs was coming down the road? We did. But where is it an emergency to run scabs into a work area, whether it be the coal mines or Kellogg or John Deere or where it's at? Where is the emergency to take people into a workplace to run the blue lights and sirens and these people aren't even paying tax dollars here in Alabama. I mean, you know, it doesn't make sense. So uh, we, we've got a lot that's been going against us, you know, that's been fighting against us. You know, so. Yeah, I would say so. And um, and Dan, I want to I want to bring you in here and and ask, um, you know, how this has been playing out for y'all on the Kellogg's picket line. I know it may not necessarily be you know, the exact same situation, but um, you know the the courts have also been involved in that strike. Uh, am I am I right about that? Yeah, yeah well, we have a uh, temporary injunction against us currently. And, uh, you know, what Larry said, shoot, you can almost cut and paste it, you know, um, to, to ours. We've had, uh, they bring them in on buses and uh, those buses fly through our picket lines. We've had people hit. Uh, luckily, we haven't had anybody go to the hospital, but Kellogg's is doing 24 hour surveillance. Uh, and then they have security guards with handheld cameras too. So they get every angle and they can pick and choose, uh, you know, wh which videos they, they show the courts. Um, so it, it leaves you at a disadvantage. We try to get cell phone footage the best that we can. Uh, we even purchased GoPros uh, for our gate where the trucks and buses go in and out, but uh, you know, the cold weather and, and battery life uh, just it really wasn't feasible to to try to re record as much as they were recording. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the the same day the uh, the TRO was implemented, Kellogg's hired a, we call them goons. They would go around to each one of our picket sites, uh, try to get us to uh, drink alcohol with them. Uh, and try to get us to break the law so so they could have us on video breaking the law the same day the injunction was was put in place uh, we didn't we didn't fall for it uh, right now it's not as, as bad as Larry's it's still a, a civil suit it hasn't become criminal which is what they're looking for I believe once it come becomes criminal then then we would have to stay 500 feet from our picket sites uh, as of right now there's really no restrictions on our, our picketers. I know that's what they were going for by hiring those goons and uh, trying to get us, uh, you know, to, to make a mistake. Uh, you know, when we first started, uh, our lawyer, uh, the Douglas County attorney, uh, his office, uh, no, nobody could produce uh, the Nebraska state statute on what we could and could not do on the picket line because there, it had been so long since there was a strike in Nebraska, nobody, nobody knew. So we were told, you know, hey, we could we could cross the street, you know, as, as pedestrians. So that's what we were doing. Um, you know, fortunately, I haven't seen any firearms uh, pointed at us, uh, but I know we were told, you know, we can't 
we can't flip them off. We can't use profanity, uh, but they certainly can against us when they're when they're coming and going. Every every one of those scabs on the bus is flipping us off and, and yelling. Uh, but you know, it's it's a double standard, really. Uh, you know, so that's that, that's pretty much what's going on. So right right now, uh, we stay off to the side. Uh, we don't we don't walk across our driveway. We, we have an easement that we can stay on, but uh, uh, we're we're just trying to mind our p's and q's. Uh, you know, it's it's always been a, a peaceful protest um, on our side. I, I can't say as much for them. You know, with the with the way they drive their buses and vehicles through the lines, yeah, they're almost uh, instigating violence, just like just like in Larry's case. Uh, so we have to remain bigger than they are. Uh, so that's that's where we're that's where we're currently at with that injunction. Man, and I mean, like, you know, again, I I know it's we've said it already, and but it just really does highlight, right? Like how much the deck is stacked on one side against the other, right? Like you know, workers who are already have a very steep uphill battle to unionize to you know like uh you know have any sort of leverage over these bosses to um lead a strike to win a strike like there's so many barriers in place uh it, that stack the deck in favor of the bosses and then on top of that all these freaking you know like you said all the mining of your p's and q's when you're on the picket line you have to stand over here you can't step one foot over there you can't flip people off you can't cuss at them you can't do shit uh without kind of being you know uh, having the the book thrown at you meanwhile these scabs can uh you know do whatever they want on the picket line they're being escorted by police they can bring guns i mean it's just you know just really i, I just want to kind of emphasize for people watching and listening right now you know, like how dire that situation is and, and how unfair that situation is. And this should all just kind of go back to that point of us needing to, you know, stand together and show solidarity with one another. And I guess I don't want to keep you, you guys too long, but I was wondering if we could maybe round out by talking about how you fight this, right? I guess like how you can fight this uh, in the courts, but also, you know, outside of the courts, what, you know, workers on the line need to counteract this in Alabama, in Omaha, and elsewhere, I guess, for, for folks who are watching and listening, like, um, how do you how do you fight this in and outside of the courtrooms? And, and how can folks watching, uh, you know, be a part of that effort? Yeah, I can, I can uh, touch on that, you know, really, on, on the picket line, uh, you know, like I said, you 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 have to be bigger than them uh, as, as far as uh, you know the use of profanity. But really, where it all starts is is changing the changing the statutes. Uh, you know, they're they're so restrictive and they give you such a disadvantage that uh, the company is able to use the courts against you. Uh, so so really, it starts with the lawmakers. Um, and, and I think uh, we need to be more proactive um, moving forward uh, about getting these laws changed and, and sitting down with the other heads of, of unions uh, and each one of uh, the locals, right, in, in Alabama and in Omaha and Lancaster, Pennsylvania and Kentucky, everywhere around the country. We need to be more proactive and, and get together and, and think ahead. Uh, just like the companies do. The companies are always thinking ahead. They're probably thinking 10, 15 years in advance. Um, I believe Kellogg's, Kellogg's has. This has been a long time coming for them. And they pick, they pick this time for the fight. Uh, so, so we need to do the same moving forward uh, with, with meeting with our AFL CIOs uh, locally and, and statewide. And like I said, other heads of, of union members and and we need to lobby these politicians to get some of these statutes changed. I, I agree with Dan uh, that, you know, we've got to look way ahead of what's, what's happening today and look at probably the political uh, side of this too. And, 
get our people to get out and vote and to vote for people that's going to represent them. Uh, whether it be judges or mayors or governors or whoever it is, uh, you know, we, we got to make sure that our people get out and work to uh, have people in office that will support labor. Um, you know, the labor, the people in labor is the ones that made this country to start with. And we've forgotten that, it seems like. Um, it's, it's time for us as not just, you know, the mine workers, but, you know, the confectionery workers or uh, IBEW, steel workers, all of us need to form together and, and to make sure and fight the same battle on trying to get people in these offices that will work for us in the future. Um, you know, and keep our people together. That I'm sure Dan's very worried about what, what is going to take place next, you know, with his vote being turned out. Uh, but, you know, keeping the people together is, is one of the hardest things that we face out there is trying to make sure that our guys understand that we're there for them and that that company's not. That the companies, it sounds like Kellogg's doing some of the same things that Warrior Mets is Mets doing, and they're definitely not concerned for the the workers' well-being. All they're worried about, they're they're worried about the greed that they've got and what they can make out of it. You know, uh, but if we can keep our people together, I think we can go a long way and. Uh, uh, Dan, like I told you earlier, if you need me, call me. Thanks, Larry. Thanks, Larry. Well, and, you know, I guess on that on that note, um, just as a kind of final quick question, um, you know, I know we we mentioned earlier that you know it's it's probably no secret that Warrior Met and Kellogg's, um, to say nothing of Columbia University and the other you know um, places where workers are on strike right now. You know, they, they, these companies are definitely thinking about kind of what the cold weather and the holidays approaching is going to do to workers and their families, and they're hoping that it will demoralize them, and they're hoping that, again, people will forget about them. So I was wondering if, if Larry, Dan, if you had any kind of like final words to people who are watching and viewing, uh, you know, about you know, the, the, the strikes that are ongoing, um, any kind of final messages for folks as we head into the holidays? Yeah, I think, I think uh, for me and uh, BCTGM versus Kellogg's here, you know, the easiest thing uh, people can do if they want to uh, support our, our movement and our cause is to simply not buy Kellogg's. That's the easiest thing people can do. You know, they, they can bring in, you know, a million scab workers and, and try to produce the, the cereal that, that we've all known our whole lives. But uh, if, if nobody's buying it, it doesn't matter how much they make. So, so that's uh, one of the fronts we're fighting on is our boycott movement. It's uh, starting to take a foothold. Actually, interestingly enough, after this injunction got put on us, uh, we ran some data analytics through Anoto Global out of uh, Washington, D.C., and 24% uh, of people after after hearing about that injunction said they were going to start boycotting Kellogg's and only 3% of, of people were actually sympathized with Kellogg's uh, during this time. So uh, like I said, that, that, that would be the ways don't buy Kellogg's products. It's really easy to do. <laughs> Well, I guess mine is not quite as simple as that, but uh, I can promise you I won't buy Kellogg's. Uh, and we'll, we'll make sure that our membership will not buy Kellogg's. Uh, we will make sure, come Wednesday night, we've already talked about it a little bit at the rallies, but come Wednesday night, we'll make sure that that's loud and clear with our membership. Uh, you know, with, with our part, I guess the uh, community's got to just 
you know, stand behind these guys that's working because they're they're their neighbors, they're their uh, uncles, their brothers. Uh, you know, they've got to stand behind those guys and and understand that this company, see, our our product goes overseas, so we can't just say don't buy that product. Uh, we we really just got to make sure that the the uh, community understands that this company they're not worried about the community or anything. They're 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 just worried about the profit. And you know if we can get them to really realize that all that we are asking for is to get us back to 2016 standards in the contract. We're, we're not asking for a lot. Uh, and the uh, community just stand behind us. And, and that's going on pretty much right now. There, there's a lot of support for Christmas and uh, a lot of support for, you know, the people that's out on strike. Um, but, you know, just trying to make sure this community does understand that and make sure that the uh, political, the, the politicians understand that and stuff too. So. so that is Larry Spencer, Vice President for District 20 of the United Mine Workers of America, which represents the 1100 coal miners at Warrior Met Coal who have been on strike since April. And Dan Osborne, uh, who's worked at the Kellogg's plant in Omaha, Nebraska for 18 years and currently serves as president of the Bakery Confectionery Tobacco Workers and Grain Millers International Union, Local 50G, down there in Omaha, uh, where workers, um, at, where some of the 1,400 Kellogg's workers in multiple states have been on strike since October 5th. Dan, Larry, thank you both so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It was a pleasure being on. For everyone watching, this is Maximilian Alvarez at The Real News Network. Before you go, please head on over to therealnews.com forward slash support. Become a monthly sustainer of our work so we can keep bringing you important conversations and coverage just like this. Thank you so much for watching.